Uh, Let me begin uh, by reading to you three verses from the Bible. I want you to think uh, in your minds, how are these verses connected? You are to keep my statutes. You must not crossbreed two different kinds of livestock. Sow your fields with two kinds of seed or put on a garment made of two kinds of material, Leviticus 19. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edo. The Lord was extremely angry with your ancestors, Zechariah chapter 1. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, 1 John chapter 4. They're all quotes from the Bible, all quotes from books in the Bible. How do they actually relate to each other? I mean, we've gone from don't crossbreed sheep to God is really angry with your ancestors to let's love one another. How do they connect? How do they, I mean, how do they even come from the same God? He seems mighty confused, doesn't he? He wants to have a hand in our sheep breeding, in our clothes. He wants to tell us he's angry and then he wants to tell us he loves us. They're all from the Bible. How do they relate? Well, the accusation by many in our community is that you can't make them connect. In fact, that actually proves that the Bible's a waste of time, only useful for toilet paper and starting fires. They contradict. They're out of date. They're useless. Just like the Bible, it makes no sense of the modern world. Yeah, we've just read the Bible, haven't we? We've just read a part of the Bible that says we believe that what we have here is God's word, that it's actually useful for life. In fact, not only useful but central. In fact, the whole Bible fits together. Over the next 10 weeks, we're going to see what that looks like. In your newsletters, you would have received a little postcard-sized sheet that gives you the sermon series over the next 10 weeks. Uh, the, the chapters connected there or the titles are connected with this book, God's Big Picture. There's still seven left up the back, 15 bucks. And we're going to look at how all of God's word fits together. The aim is to help us understand how to find our way around the Bible and see that it all holds together and points to Jesus. Let me pray because that's a big job. And let's just look at some of the surface ideas this morning. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thank you that we can read it. Father, help us to understand it. It just seems so crazy sometimes so contradictory, so separate to our world. Help us to see why it is so important for our world at the moment and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. I want to introduce this series by looking at four verses. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, page 1061. Let me read them. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. There are three fundamental building blocks for understanding the Bible. You'll see them there on your outline under point one. Uh, the first is this. At the heart of the Bible, at the heart of everything that goes on, is this very simple truth. God speaks. <coughs> God is talkative. God communicates. I've grown up with the surname Gabbett. It was abbreviated or extended in high school to gab a lot because my family had the reputation for speaking a lot. I pale into insignificance when it comes to God. Everywhere you open the Bible, you have God speaking. In fact, that's what the Bible is. It's the revelation of God's word. Now, did you notice what I said there? I didn't say it contains God's word, did I? I said it is God's word. From the first word, which was, in, to the last word, which is, yeah, I can't remember. Is it amen? It's amen. Amen. Into Amen, every single word in between, and those two are God's word. They don't contain God's word, they are. 
And when you open it, you'll see what God's word does. What does it do in Genesis chapter 1? It makes things, doesn't it? In Genesis chapter 3, it judges things. In Genesis 3 and through the rest of Genesis, it promises things and reveals things. It hides things and it makes things clear. And when we come to God speaking, we need to recognise that he uses humans. Did you see that there in Hebrews chapter 1? He spoke to the fathers by who? The prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God uses people to speak. People are given God's word and then they speak it to the world. Uh, Often they'll write it down. That's why we get the Bible. It's God's spoken word and God's written word. And when he does so, when God speaks, did you notice when he speaks? Did you pick that up? He's spoken at different times and in different ways. There in verse 1, the Bible covers over 2,000 years of writing. Across that time, different people, different places, different circumstances, different stages of life, different types of literature from history to poetry to songs to personal letters to biographies. God uses all of them to speak. And there's one basic division in all of those books. It's the division. Did you notice it there in verse 1 and verse 2? Long ago, by the prophets, in these last days, by his son. The Bible's divided into two parts, isn't it? Old Testament, New Testament. In fact, hold your hand there in Hebrews 1 and turn to your index in your Bible. Turn to your index in your Bible and you'll see the division there and all the types of literature. You'll see that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. We'll deal with what those words mean over the next few weeks. Uh, There in the Old Testament, you've got 39 books. You've got history from Genesis down to Esther. You've got poetry, Job, down to the Song of Songs. Then you've got prophecy, Isaiah, through to Malachi. The original Hebrew Bible divided it up slightly differently. The law, Genesis to Deuteronomy. The prophets, Joshua to two kings, and then Isaiah to Malachi, and then the writings, which is all the rest. That's long ago. And then in these last days, you've got the New Testament, don't you? Did you see that there on the right-hand side? 27 books. Uh, You've got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the biographies of Jesus. You've got the history, Acts, which is what happens when Jesus ascends to heaven and the early church starts. Then you've got all those personal letters, Romans right through to Jude. And then you've got that funny odd sock at the end, don't you? Revelation. No one quite knows where to put that one. So the Bible, and the word means book, is made up of 66 books in two parts, written across history by a number of authors, and it's all whose work? God's work. Now, I don't know how you go in conversations. I I don't like awkward silences. People might have picked that up. You know when you're talking with someone and there's that awkward silence, what what do you, I naturally try to fill it up. Much better to hear my voice than hear nothing, isn't it? God doesn't have awkward silences. He doesn't speak because there was a void. He doesn't speak because he's got verbal diarrhea. He doesn't speak because he likes the sound of his own voice. He speaks because he's talking to people, isn't he? When God speaks, he talks to people. It's there in verse 1. To the who? Fathers. Who's he spoken to in verse 2? To us. Now, who does God speak to? He speaks to people, all people. Why does he speak to all people? Because all people are made in his image. We learnt that last year, didn't we, in Genesis? But he's spoken to particular people for all people at various points. He's spoken to God's people, the Jews, the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham. Do you remember them from Genesis 12 last year? And he uses them to speak to the world. How well do they do? Not great, do they? And so that means that God persists with his method, but it narrows down in the New Testament. He speaks to us by one person. Who is it there in verse 2? His son. Now, he's a Jew, so he hasn't neglected his people, has he? But it's come down to one of them. 
in the New Testament, his son himself speaks to people. So the Bible is God's word spoken to people. And you'll notice there on your outline that it's about Jesus who brings salvation from sins. One message, one message right throughout the whole Bible, God dealing with something. Did you notice that there in verse 2? Look at verse 2. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In the past, God used people to speak to people, but now God himself has come. Did you pick up that description of Jesus there? How Jesus is described as the final messenger from God? He actually is God, isn't he? He made the world with God. Did you see that there? Made the universe through him. Jesus is God because he is the radiance of God's glory, the exact expression of his nature. Jesus is God because, do you notice there, he sustains all things by his what? His powerful word. Jesus is God because he's seated on a throne above all the universe. In the past, God used people to speak to people. To us, to everyone, he himself has come as a person to speak to us. But Jesus is not just a talker. He's a doer, isn't he? Did you pick that up there in verse 3? He came to do something after making purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God speaks to all people because all people have the same problem, don't they? What's that problem? It's sin, isn't it? It's the attitude and action that puts me, I, at the centre of the universe. That says, God, I don't want to listen to you. I know better than you. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want you talking to me. And you know how that works in personal relationship when someone does that with us? It creates more than an awkward silence, doesn't it? It breaks the relationship. It's just like us and God. The relationship is broken. And the Bible is the account of God dealing with that break. God speaking to people about Jesus who has come to deal with human sin. Now, before we finish off, let me draw out some implications of that at point three on the outline. Uh, we've learned, I, I hope you picked it up from the kids' talk and perhaps from what I've been saying, that the Bible has many authors, doesn't it? As many authors with one author, God speaking. Uh, the Bible is one book made up of many books. All those clothes, different items of clothing. One book, different types of books. And that means that we read them differently, don't we? In our household, we've got a number of books. We've got catalogues. We've got novels. We've got histories and we've got letters. Do you read them all the same? You don't, do you? They're all written with similar language. But you've got to read them as the type of book they are. And as all those books hold together with one author, it's got one thing. It's got a theme that threads all the way through it that's connected to Jesus and him dealing with that break between humans and God, the break caused by sin. It's a movement. I hope you picked that up from Hebrews 1. There's a movement from prophets to Jesus, from God speaking promises to God doing what he promises. There's a movement from promise to fulfilment on the same plan. The way to summarise all that, is to pick up an idea in the Bible that moves right through it. And the boys are going to put this up on the overhead. There's a slide up there about God's big picture. Uh, you can't quite read that, but I'll work through that in a moment. The, the whole theme of the Bible, the clothesline that holds it together, is this concept, God's kingdom. God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. That's always been God's plan. God's plan A through to Z. 
He's only ever had one plan. And if you think about it, and I'm giving you a preview of next week, that's exactly what you have as the Bible begins, don't you? God's people, who's that? Adam and Eve. They're in God's place, Garden of Eden, and they're under God's rule and blessing. Just don't eat from that tree, but I'm going to give you everything else. That's a rule and a blessing, isn't it? And the Bible is a, the account of how God deals with that breaking and bringing it back, but even better. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at how that pattern perishes and then God promises and then partially fulfills and then talks about the future and then how Jesus comes and then we proclaim it to the world and then it's all finished with the perfect kingdom. God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. That's God's big picture across the whole Bible. Let me finish with some very simple implications. You'll see them there on your outline under the last point. At the heart of the Bible is God and a certain view of God. Just to do what we're doing today says we have a certain view of God, doesn't it? God speaks. He reveals. He's not the same as us, but he's close in terms of proximity. God's relevant. Why else would we keep reading the book? God's just. He knows what's going on. God loves and God judges. Whatever else you want to say, just in the fact of opening the Bible, we have said we believe those things about God, about what this thing called the Bible is. The second implication is this. The nature of the Bible affects how we read it. One author, one account, 66 books, two parts, different types of literature. That takes me back to those verses we had at the start. Cross-breeding sheep, not wearing clothes made of two types of thread, God being angry at his people, God loving. How do they make sense? Well, if you think about it, they fit into that big picture of God's people in God's place under God's rule. God gives his people laws, not so that they obey them to get into God's people, but so they display him to the world, that he's different, unique. How well do they do it? Keeping those laws to show God to the world? Not great. And so God judges them, sends prophets to say, come back, and they don't. And yet in his judgment, God still loves them. And so he sends his son Jesus to save that people by dealing with their sin so they can show God to the world. And that people are meant to be characterised by that, the love he's had for us. That's how they fit together in this big storyline, which brings us to the last point. The Bible is to us. The Bible is relevant. The Bible actually speaks to our world today. You can deal with that in one of two ways. I've been reading a book this week by people who are part of our denomination who say, well, of course the Bible contradicts itself. Why would you look to the Bible to tell you how to live life? In fact, a better way to understand how to live life is just to look at each other's personal experience and then maybe tag it to a part of the Bible because your own experience is far more important than what God says. That would be one way to deal with how relevant the Bible is, wouldn't it? In fact, all that does is say the Bible's irrelevant. Another way might be to do, and, and again, this is something close and personal, might be to do what people like my mum and dad and my sister have said. The fires are coming. We've evacuated our home. How do I make sense of this? Well, the Bible tells me the world's broken. The Bible tells me that when we've left to our own devices, it's mucked up. The Bible tells me that there's something bigger than this so I can deal with what's in front of me. There's two ways to deal with how relevant the Bible is to us today, isn't there? One of the things I hope we learn over the next 10 weeks as we dive into the Bible is that we'll understand how relevant it is so that it's applied to our lives, so that we talk to others about it. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Our Father, this has just been a dip in through Hebrews 1 into what your word is. Father, we thank you that it is so big and so broad that we'll never get to the depths of it. 
But Father, we thank you that it is so simple that anyone can open it, read it and understand it by your help. Father, help us to understand it and apply it to our lives. Amen.